The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The member for Hughes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's pleased to rise this evening to speak on the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation Amendment. Deputy Speaker, when we on this side of the House, or should I say not just Liberals, not just Nationals, but all Australians want some guidance of where we should be on a particular issue. I think there is no better place to go back and look at what is known as the Forgotten People speech by Sir Robert Menzies. What did Menzies say about the importance of housing in that speech? He talked about homes material, homes human and homes spiritual. And he said, Deputy Speaker, and I quote directly from his Forgotten People speech, I do not believe that the real life of this nation is to be found in the great luxury hotels and the petty gossip of the so-called fashionable suburbs or in the officialdom of the organised masses. It is to be found in the homes of the people who are nameless and unadvertised and who, whatever their individual religious conviction or dogma, see their children as their greatest contribution to the immortality of their race. The home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. It is indispensable condition to, of continuity. Its health determines the health of society as a whole. He continued. I've mentioned homes material. What of homes human and homes spiritual? Let me take them in order. And Menzies went on to talk about homes material. He said, the material home represents the concrete expression of the habits of frugality and saving for one's own home. Your advanced socialist may rave against private property even while he acquires it. But one of the best instincts in us is one that induces us to have one little piece of the earth with a house and a garden which is ours, to which we can withdraw, in which we can be amongst friends, into which no stranger may come against our will. If you consider it, if you will see it, as in the old saying, the Englishman's home is his castle. It is the very fact that leads onto the conclusion that those who seek to violate that law, violating the soil of England, must be repelled and defeated. Deputy Speaker, Menzies was exactly right. And from his generation, we saw the greatest increase in home ownership our nation had seen. But yet, Deputy Speaker, over the last decade, unfortunately, politicians in this place and in our state chambers and our local governments, Deputy Speaker, have let our nation down. They have put artificial restrictions on the number of houses available, with restricted zoning laws, Deputy Speaker. And we haven't had enough homes being built in this nation compared to our increase in population. And that has pushed the price of houses up, Deputy Speaker, where for many in our nation today, many young people, Deputy Speaker, have simply said, bugger it. They've said it's simply too hard to save for a home. We have to correct this, Deputy Speaker. We have to take every available step to us to correct this. We have to give opportunities to young Australians to own their own home. That should be one of the central priorities of this parliament, this government, and this chamber, Deputy Speaker. Now, Deputy Speaker, the way to do that is quite simple. We have to go back to the good old-fashioned laws of supply and demand. If we're going to have a migration rate of 100,000, 150,000, 200,000, even 300,000 that we saw during the Rudd, Gillard Rudd years, Deputy Speaker, We've got to make sure that we are building that housing stock for that number of people 
that settle in Australia. And we are doing right, Deputy Speaker, to try and decentralise some of our migration rates. Yes, I know it's hard, and yes, we have to have jobs out in our country and regional areas, but that's what we must aim. To have a broad and wide landmass like Australia, and to have everyone wanting to congregate in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or even over in Perth in high-rise apartments, Deputy Speaker, we are building people, putting them in like battery hens lined up in apartments, Deputy Speaker, is detrimental to our nation's welfare. It is detrimental to the kids, Deputy Speaker, that do not have the opportunity and privilege to run and play in their own backyard. Now, Deputy Speaker, what have we seen? Well, on this side of the House, we understand those problems and we are sensibly working through them. What do we see on the other side of the chamber? We see typical Labor policy, Deputy Speaker, short-term solutions without looking at the unintended consequences of their policy. Failing to learn from the mistakes of history, Deputy Speaker. And here we go again, Deputy Speaker. We are seeing Labor's policy on housing is to have an attack on negative gearing because it sounds evil. Let's be very clear, Deputy Speaker, what Labor's attacks on negative gearing is. Firstly, they try and make out that negative gearing is some dodgy tax deal that people are engaged in, Deputy Speaker. It is a simple principle. If you are investing in an asset to try and create wealth, income and cash flow, Deputy Speaker, your interest expenses are an expense, Deputy Speaker, that you can claim as a tax deduction. That just doesn't apply the principle to housing. It applies to shares. It applies to commercial property. It applies to machinery. It applies to every type of investment class that exists. But what the Labor Party want to do, they want to say that those school teachers and firemen and plumbers and small business people and middle class Australians, they want to deny that opportunity to them. Oh, if, you've got a, if you're from the big end of town, Deputy Speaker, and you've got your affairs structured through companies, you can, of course, still under Labor's policy, negatively gear property. But if you are a wage and salary earner, the Labor Party wants to take that opportunity away from you. And what are the effects? What are the effects of this policy, Deputy Speaker? We've seen today. Modelling from the Master Builders Association. What will the effects of Labor's policies be? Well, oh, a fall in new housing construction of up to 20, sorry, not 20, 42,000 dwellings over five years. 8,000 fewer houses. 34,000 fewer apartments. That is the consequence of Labor's ill thought out policy. And what about employment in the housing construction sector, Deputy Speaker of Labor's policies? 32,000 less jobs. That's in my electorate. The plumbers and the electricians and the landscape gardeners and the tradesmen and the plasterers and the bricklayers 32, that rely for their income on housing construction. 32,000 jobs less in that sector under Labor's policy. In New South Wales, a $1.4 billion contraction in building activity in the first year alone, a 6 per cent decline in building activity in my home state of New South Wales. That is the policies of what the Labor want to afflict on our housing market. And, Deputy Speaker, this is happening at a time where there is already the construction cycle is in a decline. You couldn't pick a worse time to implement this policy. And like the majority of Labor Party's policies, Deputy Speaker, as we see, it hurts the very people, the very people that they think that they are helping. Because we've seen that what happened before, Deputy Speaker, back in the 80s, when Labor thought this was a great idea and they could be very popular, let's go after negative gearing. What does history tell us, Deputy Speaker? We know in Sydney, rents went through the roof. So those people renting, trying
trying to save and put some money aside to save a deposit, they are going to be hit by Labor's policies, Deputy Speaker, because they're going to have more rent, higher rents to pay. And yet, Deputy Speaker, you'd think with the historical evidence, with what we are seeing in the housing cycle today, with report after report that puts out how misguided and dangerous and counterproductive Labor's policy is, you would expect that they would say, OK, we've got it wrong, we're going to pull back. But no, Deputy Speaker, they're knuckling down. They're knuckling down on a policy that will actually harm the housing market, create less houses, push rents up, Deputy Speaker. And we know if they were ever able to implement this policy, the only question will be, Deputy Speaker, is how much damage that is done, how many jobs are lost, how much rents go up, until they do what they did back in the 80s, Deputy Speaker, and they realised they got it wrong, and they realised the harm that they were doing, and they reversed that policy. Let's hope they never get that opportunity, Deputy Speaker. Now, Deputy Speaker, back on the specifics of this bill. The amendments to the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation Act of 2018 this was the government has recently established the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, a new corporate Commonwealth entity dedicated to improving housing outcomes for Australians. The National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation was established on the 30th of June this year upon the commencement of the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation Act of 2013. The corporation operates with $1 billion national housing infrastructure facility and affordable housing bond aggregator. This will provide local governments, registered community housing providers and other eligible applicants with finance for infrastructure that will unlock the supply of new housing. That's what we need to do, Deputy Speaker. We don't need mad policies, counterproductive policies attacking negative gearing for teachers for firefighters and for the middle class, Deputy Speaker, we need policies that unlock the supply of new housing. And that, Deputy Speaker, is exactly, exactly what this policy is aimed at. The bill implements the amendments to the Act regarding the composition of the board and the time frame for review of the operation. The bill also amends the Act to make provisions for the establishment of a special account for the bond aggregator function. The amendments concerning the composition of the board of the corporation and the time frame for review of the operation of the Act are minor in their effect and a full commitment of the government gave to the opposition during debate in the Senate on the bill back in June 2018. The bill will create a special account for the purposes of the $1 billion line of credit appropriated to the Department of Treasury for the function of the Commission. Upon the commencement of the bill, the $150 million already appropriated to the Commonwealth for purposes is to be credited to the special account. The bill also appropriates the remaining $850 million of the $1 billion line of credit, which is to be credited to the special account over four years from the commencement of the bill. The bill will provide a schedule of crediting for the remaining $850 million. Deputy Speaker, this is just a further example of what this House is doing and this government is doing to make sure that we can give as many Australians as possible to own their own home. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to conclude, and these comments are my own, not that of the government, but I believe it is time, Deputy Speaker, that we need to look and to give young people the opportunity to use part of their superannuation savings to buy their, as a deposit for their own first home. Deputy Speaker, anyone that goes into retirement without owning their own home, Deputy Speaker, will struggle unless they do so. So be able to say that you could put aside your superannuations and when you've hit the age of 65, you can take that superannuation money and then buy a house, Deputy Speaker. Why not allow people to make the investment decision for themselves? decide that with their money that they have earned, that they want to invest that in their housing for their retirement. 
to be speaking, that is good, but needs to be done with increasing the supply of housing. That is what this bill is aimed at, and I commend it to the House. I thank the honourable member.